when did the 60s end for you? When did you feel mm -hmm. this is over for me? Something new was different is going to happen. When I was arrested, when I was arrested, um, I was with Weatherman when they were still addressing, even if it was in a confrontational manner, the public at large. They would run into high schools and say, this is a jailbreak. You're being channeled into being cannon fodder. Run out of the school. Leave these people that are trying to kill you. Um, the, the incident that I described. But then Weathermen began to feel that uh, propaganda of the deed was going to be more efficient and that creating turmoil in the mother country would turn the attention of the government inward and up the stakes for the participation for for being involved in Vietnam and so Weatherman was preparing to go under to go underground and I was purged at that time because quite accurately I was not the material for this kind of thing although I thought I was I thought and I still had something to prove and so I joined with a little group of other people who had been purged. <sighs> and we, uh, we stole ID, which Weatherman had been doing at that time. It was beginning to practice the skills of an underground life. Um, there were people who would go to fraternity parties and take people's uh, wallets and, and coats. And uh, I did some of that in this little group. And I bought a gun. And me and this other little group of weather purgies would go to a quarry and we'd do target practice. And we would go to the um, local library and we would uh, look at military manuals. Now, nothing ever came of any of this. But eventually, it caught up with me that I had bought a gun on false ID. Um, I think what happened is I cashed a bad check at a shop right and there was a camera. I had cashed one of my stolen checks to buy some to buy some groceries. Our group had broken up by this time. The invasion of Cambodia had happened. There had been a huge uprising on campus and we were skulking around in a little room plotting uh, the overthrow of the government and we missed out. And it was quite obvious, it became quite obvious that the student movement was alive, was committed, was passionate. And one of the people in our group had been in that demonstration and was instrumental in getting us together and saying, our whole approach is wrong and we've got to disperse. Now, the, maybe that was the beginning of the end for me, the, the specter of being alone, no longer in a group. It has been years now that I had been making decisions about what I was going to do with my life according to the collective. Now looking back I realized that I was in a cult. And so dispersing, becoming, be, being alone was an appalling prospect. But of course what happens is that you begin to realign yourself with other friends and other people and there were quite a few people who are now beginning to shake out. I was looking for the first time at getting a job and like feeling that it wouldn't be the, the end of my life and that I wouldn't be missing out on all the action, that there were a lot of people and we could still like live, you know, in these big collective houses and be friends and visit each other. But we, we could get jobs, we could work, we could begin to say, well, what do I want to do with my life? What am I about aside from the movement? That process was interrupted for me because I cashed one of these stolen checks and was photographed and was picked up by the police. And I knew it was just a matter of time before they dug out the fact that I had bought a weapon. That's a felony. And I jumped bail. I jumped bail and people bailed me out and they said, Judith, unless you're prepared to do some time in jail, you're going to have to leave. Now, what's your decision? Maybe it would have been better to get it over with. I think looking back now that it would have been better to get it over with because I spent five years as a fugitive. Although those five years were very useful to me. See, the movement began to, as it necessarily must, the dynamic of it was inevitable, began to really coalesce 
with the great underground of dispossessed people of America, a street people, uh, go-go dancers, uh, uh, potheads, um, working poor young people, um, all, all kinds of people that lived kind of on the fringes. And once I became a fugitive, that was where I was naturally drawn. And living as an underground person in the society, you begin to live in the underground of your own psyche. So I learned a lot about myself in those years. And what I learned is that to live underground is to return to a kind of a childhood because there's no, there's no time. Time stopped. Now, m some people who went underground did so with a purpose to continue to wreak havoc t um, on the system, to do deeds of propaganda, to hold up banks, to fund whatever organizations that money was being channeled to. Um, I have come to really believe that our society is our fate and that we work with it and to accept it without believing in everything it does as we don't necessarily believe and congratulate ourselves for any of one or, or all of our particular acts, but to accept it, to accept our society, to accept ourselves um, is really essential for <laughs> for our development, for our perspective, for a sense of reality, and for being productive towards whatever end that we decide we want to go towards. We must accept ourselves, we must accept our society, we must accept everything that's involved in creating the situation, having compassion for it, having understanding for it, without endorsing it, but having compassion, having acceptance. And to live underground is to suspend participation in that society, and participation in self-development. I went, I went backward, and perhaps I did a lot of things I needed to do, but after five years, I came to the conclusion that they could lock me up in jail for the rest of my life, and I would be making more progress than if I remained a fugitive, because I would still be, in a way, in my society. I would be in its hands, what, whatever they wanted to do with me. I needed to put myself back in the hands of my country and my society to be myself. I am in my 40s. I am still in the process of getting my head straight. I know exactly how seriously and how horribly I have gone wrong. The kinds of thoughts that I used to think about people, the kinds of terroristic thoughts that used to go through my mind towards my fellow human being were so profound and have told me that there is so much amiss in my own psyche that I have such a serious responsibility to deal with that it would be unconscionable for me to set myself up again in any kind of posture of leadership without grappling with that work. And I think people who came after us because they did not put themselves on the line in the same way because the circumstances did not call for it. I believe that if the circumstances had called for it, any generation of American people would have done what we what we did. We were not unique. We came out of an idealism and a passion and a commitment and a great spiritual beauty in ourselves as human beings and human beings as general, in general, and as Americans. We responded. And any, any generation would have done it. But because we were on that front line and because we had to grapple not only with the geopolitical forces of darkness, but the way that that corresponded to forces of darkness that were within us. We made a lot of mistakes and we learned a lot about ourselves that was very negative and very dark. And I think we are still, and it has become a priority for many of us, to enlighten ourselves, to bring ourselves to more of a state of peace, openness, and love. I've come to believe that love is really the great healing force of the world. And we are not in leadership because we know what it means to put yourself into that posture if you're not, not very, very full of love inside. I personally um, am trying to cultivate that within myself. <laughs> and I think as we do, as a nation, not only as a generation, 
But perhaps this will be our leadership that as a generation will be able to show how empowered and how effective we can be coming from a place of love, of compassion, rather than of confrontation, of hatred and contempt. Do you carry the 60s in you? Always, always. It's my reference point. It's my reference point for my whole life. It always will be. And yet I feel very brand new right now. <laughs>